This is the 12 inch version of the Light Harmonic Thunder subwoofer. You probably have never heard of Light Harmonic. Is this just another no name brand that popped up on Amazon? Or is this a legit subwoofer? Let's find out. Light Harmonic specializes in bolt in replacement speakers for Tesla, and they seem to have a thing for carbon fiber. More on that later. Now they don't list their subwoofers on their website, but you can find them on Amazon. Speaking of their website, check out this beauty right here. This is a DAC that's listed for $31,800. So already we should have some very high expectations for this subwoofer. Surely a company that pumps out something that expensive must have some serious engineering behind it. This subwoofer has dual coils, dual magnets, and a dual coin circuit in coaxial alignment. I have no idea what that means. If you're a subwoofer expert, a designer or a builder, why don't you chime in down in the comments and tell me what a dual coin circuit is. I think something may have gotten lost in translation. The Amazon description says it has an enhanced linear flux or ELF structure for ultra linear response. Let's crack open the box. Now this is supposed to be a thousand watt RMS subwoofer. The Amazon listing claims 3,500 watts of max power, but the box has 3,000 watts stamped all over it. That is uh, <laughs> never a good sign. And here is the subwoofer. And it looks kind of cool. It's got a carbon fiber cone and a carbon fiber dust cap. And yes, that is the real thing. Carbon fiber is light and strong and I'll show you how strong it is in just a little bit. The basket appears to be a cast aluminum. Uh, it's not stamped, so I guess it must be cast. It looks really familiar to me. There are several subwoofers that use a very similar frame. Here it is next to a 10 inch Dayton Audio Ultimax. And the basket looks almost the same. A key difference right here is that the light harmonic has a ring that holds the spider to the frame. The light harmonic has some insulation on the tensile leads and it's got a nice pole vent plus some perimeter vents on the bottom of the magnet. So it looks like it should have plenty of cooling. Speaking of vents, here's a nice shot of the three inch voice coil peeking through this arch shaped vent. The Ultimax has the exact same arched shaped vents, but the Ultimax has a little grill over their vents. Now Light Harmonic provided virtually no specifications other than the power handling and the nominal impedance of that three inch voice coil. No recommended box size, no TS parameters. And to make matters worse, the marketing contact that I was dealing with doesn't seem to understand the basic terminology of the specifications of a subwoofer. When I asked them what the X-Max was, they responded that the maximum power was 3,500 watts. Or maybe it's 3,000 watts. That's what's on the outside of the box, so who knows? So what we have here is a company that goes through the expense to produce drivers with these exotic carbon fiber cones, but they don't provide any technical specifications, and they don't appear to know what technical specifications even are. I'm not sure what to make of that. It doesn't really inspire a lot of confidence. And it's definitely not good for the DIYers like myself that like to build their own enclosures. So let's see what we can figure out. This little box right here is a DATS combined with some PC software. I can use this to measure the TS parameters. And with those, we can optimize a custom subwoofer enclosure. In order to get accurate measurements though, you need to break in the subwoofer first. So I ran some sweeps for about three days while I was out in the garage working on another project. Hey, this is cool. Check this out. You can see in this shot that the subwoofer cone is kind of wobbly. It's not actually wobbling. All of that is due to the CMOS sensor in the camera. This is what's known as shutter roll or the effect of a rolling shutter. Digital cameras don't just open and close the shutter like an old school camera with film would have done. Instead, they have a sensor and that sensor scans the image, usually from top to bottom or right to left. And the subwoofer is playing at just the right frequency so that it's in a different position at the beginning and the end of that scan. You play at different frequencies or turn the camera upside 
upside down or sideways, the wobbling effect would change. And of course, if it actually were wobbling that much, the voice coil would rub against the gap and something would break. And now that it's uh, broken in and the suspension is nice and soft, let's hook it up and see what happens. All right, so I've got the subwoofer here behind me on the workbench and I've got my laptop set up and I've got the DATS connected. Now you don't need to break a subwoofer in in order to use it, but you do really need to break it in if you're gonna measure the TS parameters. Over time, as the subwoofer plays, the suspension gets a little bit looser. And so if you run the TS parameters on a subwoofer that's not been broken in, you don't get accurate results. So when manufacturers measure their TS parameters, they're supposed to be parameters for a subwoofer that's broken in. That way we can understand how it's actually gonna behave out in the real world. Now I've also gone ahead and wired the voice coils in series because you're supposed to get TS parameters with voice coils wired in series. So now it's just a matter of hooking up the test leads And it's also important that you don't block any vents whenever you are taking your TS parameters. So we're gonna have a couple of chunks of wood so we have some clearance for the vent. Now it's onto the laptop and we fire up the software and we wanna come over here and we want to measure free air parameters. So this is telling us that our resonant frequency is actually around 50 Hertz. That's a pretty high resonant frequency. Now that is really strange. I've never seen a 12 with such a high resonant frequency. Uh, we also call that the free air resonance or the FS. The resonant frequency is a function of the weight of the moving parts, the cone and the voice coil, and the stiffness of the suspension. All things being equal, a heavy cone will have a lower free air resonance than a lightweight cone. And so this carbon fiber is really lightweight and strong. So that high FS could be due to the carbon fiber cone, or it could be due to a very stiff suspension or maybe some combination of both. So the next step is to measure the VAS or the VAS. To do that, we measure the cone diameter from the middle of the surround to the middle of the other edge of the surround and place a weight with a known mass on the cone and then run the sweep again by hitting the little button that says measure the VAS. And that VAS of course will be a function of the stiffness of the suspension. The stiffer the suspension, the smaller the VAS. And the weight placed on the cone needs to be large enough to lower the resonant frequency by about 25% in order for the DATS to work. So I added some weight. It wasn't enough. So I added some more. It wasn't enough. I grabbed some weights from a set of dumbbells and put those on the cone and it was also not enough. And I ended up adding <laughs> 20 pounds and the DAT still kicked back an error message. I started to think something was wrong with the DATS and so I grabbed another subwoofer and tested it as well and that one worked just fine with a 500 gram weight on it. So it appears that I can't actually get the TS parameters for this subwoofer and that's a problem. But on the upside, 20 pounds on the dust cap, it didn't deflect or dent at all. So this carbon fiber cone is legit. And I'm not gonna keep adding weight because I don't wanna see exactly where the failure point is for the carbon fiber dust cap. Now there are other ways to measure the VAS, but I'm kinda at the point where I need to cut my losses and move on. Time is valuable. Now I did reach out to Light Harmonic one more time, explain the situation, and again ask if they happen to have TS parameters or had any advice for getting these TS parameters or if they could even explain what was going on. And they didn't even respond to that email. This is a Q-Bomb prefabricated subwoofer box that I've had laying around. It's probably tuned to about 34 Hertz or so. I'm gonna wire the voice coils in parallel. So I'm assuming that these are dual two ohm voice coils. So I'll drop it down to one ohm. We're gonna throw it in the truck and see how it performs. Let's start with a listening impression before we do some SPL test. While we are listening and getting some idea of the sound quality, I wanna give a shout out to my patrons with that extra bonus shout out to Bo, David T, Bam Bam, Dylan, Jerry Olab, LLC, and Baba. I would describe the sound as punchy, clean, and tight, the kind of words most people use to describe a sealed enclosure.
but it doesn't seem to be able to hit the lowest of the lows. I expected it to be a bit louder as well. This is literally the highest RMS subwoofer that I've ever tried, so I was expecting a lot more out of it. that this could perform a lot better in the right enclosure, but without those TS parameters, there's no way to know what the right enclosure is. How about some SPL tests? I'm not really set to do that stuff. I'm in the process of upgrading uh, both my test bench and the electrical system in my truck so I can hook up more powerful amplifiers. In fact, I've got a high output alternator sitting uh, right here on the bench and I'm gonna install it as soon as possible. I've also got some batteries in transit. When that gets installed, I'm going to connect a JP23 amplifier at that point I can really do some really awesome testing for y'all. And I couldn't afford any of this equipment without you watching my videos and doing things like clicking on the affiliate links. So right now the most powerful amplifier I have is this JP8 and that is what we're going to use. The biggest number I could hit was 129 dB and some change at 45 hertz which was a little bit disappointing and I felt like maybe I wasn't getting all the power I could so I fired up the amp dyno and we hit 500 watts right at clipping into about three and a half ohms. I was really clipping the hell out of this thing and it took a lot of abuse. It did get hot. I could feel the heat from the front of the cone. The coils were beginning to smell. Now I have no idea why I didn't get all 1000 watts at clipping. I should have been able to get that much power out of this JP8. And then I realized that I had actually never checked the voice coils. So let's grab the multimeter and let's see if we are actually getting a one ohm load at the terminals. Well, look at that. We have two ohms at the terminals. But I think the mistake that I made is that I assumed that it was a dual two ohm voice coil subwoofer. Now that I go back and read the Amazon product description, it's really kind of unclear. Now it's really common for the DC resistance to not match the nominal impedance. I have a dual two ohm sundown audio subwoofer sitting over here on the shelf and it reads about 1.8 ohms at the terminal when the voice coils are wired in parallel. So let's pull this thing back out of the box and let's measure the voice coils. There you go. It's not dual two ohm, it's dual four ohm. And this is why I'm really unhappy at the technical specifications provided by Light Harmonic. I wonder how many people are running around out there thinking they're throwing a thousand watts at one of these things and wondering why it's not really all that loud. My overall evaluation, Light Harmonic gets a big fat thumbs down for their lack of technical specifications and their complete inability to answer even the most basic technical questions. You would think that a company that sells a 32,000 dollar DAC and specializes in Tesla car audio would have an engineer on hand that could answer a couple of questions. The lackluster SPL numbers are entirely due to the incorrect and inaccurate product specifications listed on Amazon. If the average person were to buy this, they might also assume it was the dual two ohm sub and match it with an inappropriate amp and be disappointed just like I was. Now the subwoofer itself gets a thumbs up for sound quality, but a thumbs down for its inability to hit the low note. That real carbon fiber cone gets a thumbs up for its strength. I'm personally not too excited about Light Harmonic, even though they made a halfway decent subwoofer. They really lost the opportunity to really knock this one out of the park. Overall, I'll leave it to you to decide what you spend your money on. Now to see some more cool subwoofers, check out this playlist right here. I am Justin, also known as the DIY Audio Guy. If you'll hit this button right here to subscribe, I will see you on the next adventure.